in which war did you serve? Vietnam. And what was your branch of service? The U.S. Army. And your highest rank? Spec 4, which is basically a corporal. I'm learning a lot of that, too. Um, in what general locations did you serve in Vietnam? I was in I-Corps. I-Corps? Mm -hmm. That was the, from the DMZ down to, let's say, a little south of Way. Okay. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I volunteered for the draft. I said that to you, too. Because that gave me a two-year enlistment. And I thought there'd be a benefit of, and there wasn't. <laughs> Probably what you were led to believe. Yeah. And where were you living at the time? In Lakeville. Okay. Do you recall? Pardon? Lakeville, Connecticut. Okay. Do you recall the date? September 29th, 1969. That's when I went into the service. Ah, okay. Why did you join? <laughs> Again, the volunteer for the draft? Well, it's, it's funny because my stepsister and I were watching the news one night. You know, this is probably about six months before that. You know, there was a thing on about Vietnam, and I said we ought to just nuke them. And and she said, "How can you say that? Because you don't know anything about what's going on over there. It's a civil war, you know, that kind of thing." And I thought about it, and she was right. I didn't know what was going on there. And then a friend of mine, who in his junior year of college decided he wasn't going back, said, "Let's join the army." And I said, "Okay." And that's how we volunteered for the draft. <laughs> okay. And you picked the branch of service because your friend said, let's join the Army? Um, yeah, more or less. Okay. I think, uh, I mean, when I was in high school, I was going to join the Marines. But uh, then I went to one year of college, and then the Marines weren't so exciting anymore. <laughs> and, then, and I only wanted a two-year enlistment, too. So that was one of those reasons. One of the reasons. Okay. Um, what was your What were your first few days of service like when you were up at basic training? Basic down? training. Basic training. It was lack of sleep and a lot of running around doing all kinds of different things. You know, paperwork and clothing. You know, drilling and you know, close order drill or trying to. And yeah, it was. It was crazy. Um, okay, the next question is how did it feel? So basically, you know, how did you? You know, there were a lot of guys that fought. You know, they didn't want to be there. They, they just. But it was not bad as long as you could adjust to it. And I thought I adjusted fairly well. It was like a game to me. You know, you did a lot of physical fitness and then you got classroom stuff and you got to meet guys from all over the country. Yeah, it was, it was all right. It, it wasn't bad. Okay. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, let's put it that way. Oh, that's good. It was not. I mean, it was tough. Believe me, it was tough. You know, when you're in Fort Dix in September, October, November, <laughs> it got a little chilly. Yeah. And we lived, uh, our barracks were built in 1942. And they, you know, wood side we could not wax the floors because it was a fire hazard oh my gosh yeah the coal furnaces we had shovel coal wow yeah that was perfect tough. do you remember any of your instructors i remember drill sergeant drill sergeant Trevoda. Trevoda? And, yeah now you, you can figure out how to spell that okay i think it's c-h-r-o yeah oh Chiboda. yeah something like that okay and how'd you get through it? How did I get through it? Yeah. You just figured out what to do? And... Yes. At one point, I was an acting platoon leader. Um, you know, it was it was fine. I, I don't remember anything really bad, except when we did the pugil stick fighting, and I got my clock cleaned. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I mean, it was fine. You know, like I said, we... And the only thing I regret was I never did the obstacle course. And that's the 
only thing I really wanted to do because I was had upper respiratory infection and was in the hospital or something. Oh, okay. So you missed that. I missed that and I was upset about that. <laughs> they wouldn't let you go back and do it again. No, there was no time. Move on. Okay, so after boot camp, where did you go? I went to Fort Lewis, Washington for advanced infantry training. And what were your first impressions when you arrived there? That was state of Washington? The state of Washington. In the day after Thanksgiving. And I spent from there until uh, December, January, February in Fort Lewis, Washington. And the day I got there, the sun was out. The day we did a 13 mile hike or march, the sun was out, and the day I left, the sun was out. Other than that, it was either raining, snowing. It was dismal. Dismal. And we had a drill sergeant there who had left the Air Force and joined the Army. He was an alcoholic and mean. Very mean. So he just tortured us to death. I sometimes wonder how they find them. Well, you become a raging alcoholic. <laughs> What was your assignment there? Just training. Training. Training, okay. training, training. I mean, it was, to me, it was ludicrous that we were uh, at Port Lewis in the winter to train for Vietnam. But we did. And we fired everything from 45s, M16s, M14s, machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns. Light anti-tank weapons, 90 millimeter recordless rifles, hand grenades, bayonet practice, all that kind of thing. Did you have class classes too? We had classes where you take apart weapons, you learn tactics, and you know uh, how to dig a foxhole, and how to throw, you know, like you said, how to throw a grenade. And yeah, we just learned. Okay. We just learned all that kind of good stuff. Were you mostly inside or outside? Or did it depend on what you're doing? Well, the classrooms were either under a shed or in a building. Everything else was outside. Everything else was outside. Yeah. yeah. Not the Vietnam experience. No. <laughs> Imagine being hot and humid and sweaty. Cold, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where did you go after Fort Lewis? I had a two week, two or three week leave and then went to Vietnam. Flew back to Seattle, left from SeaTac Airport on Flying Tigers Airlines. Oh, you went on an airline? Commercial jet, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Where'd you go on your leave? Did you come back home? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was the typical day like for you in the service when you were in Vietnam? Well, the first 10 days I was there, all I did was sweat. I mean, that's, well, I was lucky. I was. Flew into Cameron Bay and got put in a replacement uh, brigade or something battalion. And so what we did was uh, we didn't do much other than maybe walk guard duty. And they gave us an M14 with three rounds of ammunition. So it was not even like, and Cameron Bay at that time was pretty, pretty quiet. That was down a little farther south. And like I said, we did some training there, trying to get acclimated to the weather. And, you know, went on short patrols and, you know, and there again, practicing with weapons and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, okay. that's about it. And then, um, where'd you go after Cameron Bay? Uh, and then we, like I said, we were in a replacement battalion and I got orders for the 101st Airborne in, out of Fubai, which is up north in Icor. Okay. How did you, how were you transferred up there? I think by truck, okay. but I hadn't even thought about that in a long time. I don't, I think it was truck. Okay. And what did you, what was it like up there for you? What did you do as a typical day up there? Well, at that point, we, I got Excuse me, arrived there and got assigned to my unit. I was there a day and a half, I think, and then 
got on my first helicopter and flew out to the field where I joined the guys out in the jungle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that, well, okay, right. and then what happened when you were out there? What? All we did was walk, patrol, tried to, I want to say hide from the enemy, but not really. I mean, we, we covered a lot of ground, up and down mountains and this and that. Um, I remember I got there either just, I think it was just after Easter. And I'd been in the field like three days and we were climbing this hill and there was some, I don't know if they were NVA or Viet, you know, Viet Cong on the top of the hill and there was a firefight. We drove them off the hill and then when I think about it now, it's foolish that we set up our, for the night there. And the next morning, they hit us back. And they, there was a squad of seven or eight guys, and one guy was killed, and six guys were wounded. So it wiped out that squad almost entirely with RPGs and uh, machine AK fire. And then, how did, did you have to help evacuate them? Or? Well, actually, <laughs> guy right next to me, he got hit in the head from some shrapnel and his little finger blown off. <coughs> and I was a new guy, so I looked at him, he just kind of in shock, so I took his finger and put, you know, bandaged that together so we wouldn't lose it. And then I wrapped his head and, and then, you know, ten minutes later the firefight was over, so and a guy I had just met the night before, he was the one killed. And I can't remember his name, but he was a, he was a Puerto Rican guy. And, you know, we, we kind of hit it off. And then, boom, then I carried his body to the helicopter. Okay. So. So was that back down, back down the hill? You, no, we, we you they there? dropped uh, dynamite and C4 explosives, and we blew an LZ. We got the wounded out. We brought in helicopters and met it back down so did, did did you were you evacuated on the helicopter no, too, or just the no, wounded? And just the wounded. We kept going. Okay. And it's funny because after all this hubbub, they dropped. This is kind of. They dropped eight crates, like this, of ammunition and, and uh, explosives, and they stacked them up. And I was the new guy, and they mounted and they laid a M60 machine gun on top of it. And they say, okay, they came from that way, you defend this thing. And I'm looking at them like, why am I doing this when they have RPGs and I've got 300 pounds of explosives that I'm sitting on doing it? <laughs> oh. So I did. Yeah, because you were, that's what you can't say. <laughs> and then, you know, when it had calmed down, I kind of looked down and I used to carry, I think I carried two two bandoliers of magazines from my M16 across my chest. And I looked down and the center magazine had a hole in it, that piece of shrapnel in it that had cut three bullets in half. And that was probably the same shrapnel that hit that guy in the head and blew off his finger. But it didn't hurt you at all, that protected you, at least that time. And I should have kept the magazine, but it went the way of all things. Yep. <laughs> okay, after that event, you hunker down there and... No, we, uh, we kind of regrouped a little bit and then moved on. We were, uh, I think the... Supposed to have like 35 men in a platoon. And I think the most we ever had while I was there was 17 in a platoon, maybe 18, and that's three squads, so there was, you know, five or six of us to a squad, and when you're setting up at night, you make a defensive perimeter, Right. not very big when you only have 18 people, because we used to do a lot of stuff in platoon size uh, actions, and we had a company commander that used to volunteer us for everything, I mean, Okay, you guys, go here. 
you know, I think they take a platoon out of a Bravo company and we go somewhere, or two platoons. And we, we never really worked with the first of the 501st. We were always with the second of the 506th, the first, you know, 503rd, that kind of thing. But that's the way he, he, he was, uh, actually, it was Captain Stubblefield. And he was from Kingston, New York. And he, this was his second tour, and we would have followed him anywhere. Really? He was that good. I mean, he, whenever we went to a place that might be a little sketchy, he had uh, Cobra gunships on standby, jets, artillery. We knew we were going to be protected. Wow. He was great. He was good. Was he with you from the, pretty much the beginning? Um, yeah. And then he... He, came, got, uh, he was promoted to major and he made a mess too of the battalion. And then, we got a, and then we had some really ridiculous officers from that point on. Now the colonel keeps telling me here that it couldn't have happened, but we had a finance officer who was who was a company commander for not a very long time, but yeah. A finance officer? A finance officer. Had he had any training besides no. finance? Pro probably not any more than we had. Six. Yeah. And you know, and then we just kept we kept moving. I mean, we we check out bomb strikes and uh, we just kept walking. How did you, how did you know where to go? I mean, they must have had maps. Or well, somebody we had, must have. But uh, I never. Well, I. You know, I was only a PFC at, at that point, so I didn't know anything. So you were following? Yep. And then we just, we're going that way. Okay. And not only were we fighting the enemy, we were fighting bugs, the heat, the terrain, the weather. I mean, it was... It was not a pleasant time. It wasn't all bad, but it wasn't all good either. And then you had on top of that, you know, looking for booby traps. You didn't know if you're going to be ambushed. Just, and that's what we did. And, you know, you'd pull a, you'd walk from like 7 a.m., maybe stop for a break, you know, every hour or so, and then you'd stop for lunch. But that wasn't any relaxing picnic or anything. You had to knock it. you had to be in a defensive position. And then you'd walk along and you'd shut up for the night. And there, there was always that, you know, what's gonna happen next. So She probably never never knew. We never did. No. It's not like, you know, the World War Two guys that you know, you cross this line, that's the Germans, that's the No. No. There was no lines. The big base camps were about the only the place you were relatively sick. But we did that. We were, I mean, there were times when we, I think the longest time we were out continuously was 93 days. And without that's, being at a base camp? Without being anywhere. We, well, I mean, well, we might have been on a fire base for a week or so, but that's it. And we'd get resupplied every four days. And the way you got supplied was from the helicopter. Right. Wow. I, uh, during the course of the 10, no, I got out of the field in October, I wore, I was on my third pair of boots. Yeah. So you, you go to somebody in charge and say, okay, ask them to drop boots next time or? Well, or you, they you, just get, you get what you get. Okay, you get what you they get. They drop a bunch of boots and a bunch of clothes. And okay. And sometimes you're wearing a triple extra large or, um, yeah, I think I was probably at that point somewhere around 140 pounds. And that was, I mean, that's, yeah, I think I got down to about 130. But I was in the best shape of my life. <laughs> <laughs> you want to call it that? Well, I mean, 
you were climbing these hills that then you had to you know, pull yourself up yes. on trees yep. and you know the mud would be slippery you'd slide halfway down you pull yourself back up and the pack I carried I think was somewhere around 70 pounds and I weighed 140 uh, but you know we had to carry meals for four days probably seven quarts of water ammunition everybody carried 100 rounds of machine gun ammo yeah. And then, uh, we just did that. And as you said, you had to deal with the weather too. The weather. I mean, there was. We didn't. I didn't see him, but I heard him on the radio. A guy died of heat stroke. Uh -huh. Because you know, just, that's what it was. And I remember when I first got to the field, I had a flak jacket, and I had a mosquito net, and I had an air mattress, and I had an entrenching tool, and these guys looked at me and says, okay, get rid of this, 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 this. So I got rid of the flak jacket, mosquito net, and the entrenching well, I think I kept the entrenching tool for a while. And, you know, anything that was weight. And I, you know, I see these guys going to you know, Afghanistan, all, and they're all wearing flat jackets, and I'm saying, God bless them. Yeah. But there again, they don't stay out like we did either. It was just, they were too hot and they were too heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't they provide some protection, though, too? Probably. Or not really? <laughs> yeah. Well, they were, I mean, they didn't, they didn't have the big plates in it like some of them could have. They were basically a flat vest, is what it was. Just might stop something, wouldn't stop a bullet. It wasn't worth it. It's too heavy. So, how much combat did you see or experience? Well, it wasn't all combat. It was just the the, the uh, you see that was that first time. Um, a couple other small firefights, and then we were trying to they were going to send us in to check out a bomb strike. <laughs> And helicopters came in and got ground fire. So they took it, you know, we didn't land, so they took us away and they brought it, they put artillery on the hill. And they said, okay, let's go in. Well, we got, still got ground fire. So they brought in uh, ARA, which is aerial rocket artillery, Cobra gunships, yeah. that kind of thing. So they fired up the hill and blew it apart a little more. Still got ground fire when we went in. They brought in jets with 500 pound bombs. Still got ground fire. They finally landed us about three foot, three kilometers away and brought in a B 52 strike. Now I'm three, well, three kilometers, 3,000 meters away. And the concussion from that bomb strike, I was sitting on my helmet and it stood me straight up. We went back in and still got ground fire. I couldn't believe it. Where were they hiding? The underground. We found their tunnel. Oh, under, okay. Yeah. But by this time, we landed on the hill that we originally went into, and there was nothing on it to hide behind. So, my cover was a guy who was 6'4 and about 250 pounds. He must have just come in. <laughs> he was a big boy. And I still remember that uh, they dropped me on the we came in with a helicopter and we were going to drop extra ammunition. So, like a fool, I didn't take off my backpack, but I had helicopter hovering and I'm driving cans of ammunition. And the door gunner had a flat back vest on him with a bullseye painted on it. You know, just to, just to be, just to be yeah. smart. Well, I watched two bullets go into that flat chest. And I grabbed the ammo and ran. And then, Actually, a platoon leader, a lieutenant, and his RTO were either two choppers ahead of me or two behind me. And the lieutenant got shot in the knee, and the his uh, radio operator got shot in the back or through the shoulder or something. Yeah, it was fun. I said they were landing? Yeah. Okay. So did they, they, didn't, even right they didn't even land. They didn't even land. Right. They didn't just they kept going. They kept going. Yeah. Did you hear if they survived? Yes, I met I met both of them oh. about what two years ago. 
Really? At a reunion. Yeah, we had a reunion in Little Beach, South Carolina. Yeah. It was actually for the second platoon of the first of the 501st. Okay. But I saw the ad in either the BFW Times or the American Legion magazine or one of them, so I called him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was kind of cool. I didn't know any of them, but no, it didn't matter. You, re you recognized him? That they I recognized one guy, place. and I was the, actually the radio operator that was shot. I recognized him, wow. but nobody else. Because we, I mean, like I say, we, our platoon was more or less, we only worked very rarely with company operation. Yeah. Did you have the impression that other platoons were like that too? In different locations? Oh yeah, throughout? that's how yeah. it, that's how it. That's how they together. I mean, we at one point with our 17 or 18 guys, we were surrounded. We were sent out as a blocking force for the 5th NVA Regiment, which is more than 17 people. <laughs> but we were going to be a blocking force to kind of hold them up while they hit them from the other side. Well, we were surrounded for three days. We were turning our claymores around. They were, you know, messing with us and all that kind of thing. So we, and naturally, this is where these pictures were taken when we were surrounded. And it, this guy was our point man, I think. Well, I, I can put that out there. <laughs> no, he was, he was our M79. He was our point man. He and him and we were just. And carry them 60s. So, how did you get out of that situation? We, were we moved. We had, we had what's called a mad minute one morning where everybody fires their weapons for a while to make sure nobody's there, and then we dashed. We set trip flares to see if we were being followed, and we were. And that's the only time I broke down. I mean, it was not a night, but I. Trip flare went off, I hit the ground, and I started shaking. I don't know if I cried or not, but I was, I just, you know, in the tension of being all that. Oh, yeah. And I said at that point, I'd never do that again. And I did. But, you know, I actually cracked. Well, that's understandable, but yeah, you but probably I, didn't feel that you should do that. Hmm? Well, you, it's understandable, but you didn't feel you should do that? Nope. I felt I was letting everybody down if I did that, so that was the one and only time. I mean, there were times when we were on hills and the only place you go to sleep was, this would be a tree, and you'd wrap your body around it so you wouldn't fall down the hill. That's how steep some of these things were. And sometimes, you know, the powers that be would say, climb that hill. Okay, you climb the hill. Okay, come back down, you're going to get trucked away somewhere else. We climbed back down. Oh no, you better go back up the hill. We did seven times. Just for To see if anyone was gonna fire at you? I guess. I don't know. I mean it was ridiculous. But we did it. And then they finally trucked us somewhere else. <laughs> okay, after the um after you were surrounded and you, you got out of that situation, were there any other was there any other combat? Do you Just that? sniper fire booby traps. Okay. And like I said, I pointed out our, this guy right here was our point man who went crazy. He actually re upped in the field. He extended his time in this military to get out of the field. And he thought he'd be going home, but they made him a truck driver and kept him in Vietnam. So I became point man. Oh. Well, I, because. We used to, I mean, they, they alternate point. And the guy, I was walking behind him, and he was walking up a hill using, holding his M16 by the barrel and using it as a walking stick. You know, like he was out in a park or somewhere, or on a hike. Yeah. And I said, that will not do. So I walked point from April, no, probably First part of May through August. Okay, what's the point? That's what's when you leave the group. You leave the group. You leave the group. Yep. Did you volunteer for that? I did. 
Yeah. Because I didn't trust anybody else to do it. Okay. I mean, I wasn't the best in the world, but... You didn't like what you saw? No, I did not. And nobody was ambushed. And nobody got blown up. <laughs> As we were in a company operation once, I was walking point, and, well, we were walking up a trail, and the trail split. And on this side was this big bombed out area that had been overgrown. And this side was jungle. And I looked at this in a wide open area, and it was full of spiders. Now, when I say full of spiders, the spiders were bigger than my fist. Oh my God. And the legs down. And I don't care much for spiders, little ones. <laughs> and I took the entire company right through the jungle because I was not going through that open area. And I don't know, you know, if they, you know, the other guys thought we might, because we're Americans, we take the easy way. That I had a vibe about first the spiders and then something else, and we went through and we didn't get hit. So, being the point man, you decided. Well, they told me which way to go. Okay. And I would get them there. You chose the right. I can't imagine that big. Oh, you don't know. Oh. They, no, no, it was no. You could have shot me right there. I was not <laughs> going into. I mean, when I said, and there were. Thousands of them. They made big nets in the oh, front okay. because it was an open area, so that crisscross looked like clothesline. Oh. <laughs> I you keep, probably wouldn't have gotten I get shivers. <laughs> <laughs> I bet no one would have followed you if you had chosen that way. Yeah, I, no, there's no way I would have no, chosen. No, I, no, no. <laughs> you could have shot him with guns and probably not hurt him. And there, let's see. And then we. We walked on a fire base, onto a fire base one time from in the field. They were just building it. And I'll never forget this because we've been out in the field for I don't know how long. And we walk up to where they're building this fire base and everybody's in stark fatigues and shine boots. Like they just come from, you know. Graduation or something. Pretty much. Yeah. And this major comes over to our platoon leader and his name was Bronson Hunter the Third. Our platoon, our platoon leader. He's a first lieutenant, and he walked. And he, we, you know, we didn't, we carried our water, so we didn't use it to shave. Right. Uh, you know. And this guy walked up to our lieutenant and says, "What are you pirates doing on our fire base?" <laughs> I said, "Excuse me." He says, "I don't want you on my fire base." So, okay, fine. So the fire base was here, and there was a ridge line that went up like this. So I said, okay, we'll go up the ridge line and we'll do, make an outpost for you. So we went up there and made our night defensive position. And that major just wanted to mess with us. You know, all that. I'm coming up there to check and say, you can do that, sir, but we put a mechanical ambush between you and us. Okay. And then we raised a, we found a piece of pipe up there. It must have been an old something, but about 20 feet long. One of the guys had a rebel flag. And we put that in the ground, <laughs> hung that up there. Um, that major was not happy with us. Don't you know that it could be used as a sighting for a mortar? So, yeah, okay. If there's any short rounds, it'll hit you. <laughs> and um, I think we were there two days. And then they sent us west. And when we were on this fire base was pretty much on the Vietnamese Laotian border. Okay. If we go west, all there is is Laos. So I probably shouldn't say it, but we were in Laos for 10 days. No maps. Um, I don't even know if we got how we got resupplied if we did. But we uh, we were in the house. We called in our artillery or jets. I can't remember which. Um, truck convoy of twenty three trucks. The enemy. Yeah, the enemy truck. We and that was, they weren't supposed to hit them in Laos anyway, but they did. And then one night we were up on this another ridge line, and there's a stream down here. Uh, and along the stream, there's a path. And 
Nobody heard a noise, so we all got very quiet. And there again, there's only 16 or 17 of us. We counted 110 flashlights go by the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, we figured every second or third guy had a flashlight, and they were running supply with bicycles, you know, pushing their bikes. We were very quiet, and we decided it was time for us to go away. <laughs> and but we didn't know how to get out of there. The only way we could do that was follow the river. Okay. Because, like I said, we had no real maps, and we knew that the river was going east towards the ocean, so we eventually get back into Vietnam. You know, we get to this river, and we can't walk on either side of it anymore. And this Lieutenant Bronson asked, anybody know how to swim? And I figured we're going to take a break. Yeah, I'll, I know how to swim. All right, I want you to swim down there about half a mile and see if there's any people out there. He said, you got to be kidding me. Said, yep, hit it. So I took off all my clothes and I swam down about half a mile. And then I swam back and I said, nope, nobody's there. And I thought after that, you know, how stupid can that be? I mean, I didn't have a weapon. Yeah. And I was naked. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, you know, guys who had air mattresses, we blew them up, we put all the equipment on it, but, you know, the guys who couldn't swim. Oh, know, that's right. And they held on, they held on to the air mattresses, and, you know, guys who could swim, you know, watched out for them, and we went, we did that for almost a mile. And then we got onto a trail, and you know, I think we got, just got into Vietnam and they sent helicopters with us at that point. Did you report what you saw with the enemy in transport? Oh yeah. Bikes? I mean there was so another time get... we're just walking you know, on a little trail. And I get to, let's say, you know, there's brush or jungle right here. And I kind of step and I step onto a dirt road. When I say dirt road, I mean it's regular dirt road. Like the trucks like, or whatever? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. It wasn't a trail. It was a road. And there were telephone poles with four wires. I don't know if they were electrical. I mean, and so we call that in. We want to blow these, you know, blow this up and see what happens. Don't do it. Go away. Get out, you know, go somewhere out. You know, don't do it. I, we don't know why to this day. Really? Yeah. But you were in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. You were back in Vietnam. Yep. Yep. And then, let me see, we had a platoon. I think it was just a platoon. We got a radio call that a special forces, I don't know if it was special forces, maybe Green Berets, had been attacked at night and they had to rope them out by helicopter, which means as they dropped the rope, guys hooked onto it and they pulled them out that way. That's how bad it was. So we want you to go check it out. Well, we did. We landed, spread out, and as a point man, I did a, no, a small rig finger. So I went that way, guys spread out, and I went up here and stepped over a log and boom. Booby I don't know if it was command detonated or somebody threw a hand grenade or whether I just tripped something, but I didn't see any wires, so. And that blew me from, let's say, the door to about here. Uh, I got hit in the face, left arm, chest, and the shrapnel. Couldn't see because of the dirt and stuff. So I just immediately told everybody to freeze. They could hear me. And that there were booby traps. And they sent up a guy to get me with a shotgun. And he heard a rustling, he fired the shot. And I couldn't see him, I almost shot him. So he brought me back down, and they had found, I think they said, like 20 booby traps on the LZ. Jeez. And it was all from these green grays that left all their hand grenades and their claymores and this. And they showed me my footprint when I was walking up this little finger. Um, 
my foot went like this, and this was a firing device for a claymore that would have cut me in half if I tripped it. So you had your guardian angels. I, I know I had a guardian angel. Um, and yeah, I got taken to a you know, medevac and taken to an aid station. And, I'm listening to Vietnam radio, and they say, well, today's been a good day. There's only been 19 casualties today. Well, I'm looking around this aid station. There's 24 of us sitting right here in all, you know, different disarray, I can say. Yeah. I wasn't hurt that badly, but it was enough. Um, yeah. Was it like a mass unit? It was a, yeah, kind it was of. a portable out in the field? Well, no, it? it was... Back in the base camp or something. Oh, back in the base. And I said, you know, bandage me up and say, okay, go back to your unit. What? I said, how? <laughs> so I hitched a ride on the truck and went back to the army. Uh, you know, our poor part of the base camp there. <coughs> and the guys kept saying, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be dead. <laughs> oh, I am? Yeah, you had both your legs blown off and all that. You were booby trapped. I said, oh. Blown off. I'll go away. <laughs> Send me home. And let's see, what else? So that's what they said, or was it more? It was just what rumor. Just you were going to say. And... Yeah, just rumor. I said it wouldn't hurt that bad. Got hit the face. But, um, and then. Oh, and then I got thrown out of the helicopter. We were going in for a combat assault. And I, this other guy and I were on the, we were on the left side of the helicopter. I leaned over and asked the pilot, are you going to land or are we going to have to jump? He said he's going to land. So I'm, this medic and I are standing on the skid, ready to, you know, as soon as he touches down, we're off. Well, he's hovering there about six feet off the ground. And we don't know if he's going to land or not. Well, I guess he decided not to. And so we're getting ready to just jump. And he went straight up in the air. And both of us got thrown out from about between 15 and 20 feet. Now, the other guy broke his leg in seven places. I landed on a tree across the center of my back. The matter that came. And actually, we had to stop a helicopter by pointing a rifle at the pilot. Or he wasn't going to land to pick up the medic. Well, why did, did you ever find out why he pulled off no, like that? No. Or why he wasn't no. landing? No. no. I mean, maybe he saw something that you didn't. But no, was, I mean, were, I mean, we weren't the first chopper on the ground. There was other folks already there. Oh, okay. And you know, he just evidently decided that he wasn't going to do that. And then... So do you have to go over to another chopper on the... On the ground and get your buddy when you when you landed in the tree and your friend broke his leg when yeah. you were dropped out of that helicopter yeah. did you, were you able to get to another cop cop well yeah we, we got him on another cop I was, okay i was all right i thought and then uh, three days later my left leg went numb um, and i kept falling down so they made it uh, this is a this is the part that bothered me. They gave me a casual medevac, which means you know, nothing serious, but I just couldn't keep up because my leg kept falling. <laughs> At that time, I was carrying the M60 machine gun, which was an extra 23 pounds. And so they gave me this casual medevac, and it was a 15 minute flight back to the fire base where they were going to check out my leg. And at 15 minutes, the guys walked into a clearing, and there was four or five of them, you know. Viet Cong having lunch and a firefight in city. And this guy right here, he was shot on in the inside of the upper thigh. And he had to lay out in the middle of this, and the firefight went on over him for 45 minutes. Now, when this guy got shot in the leg, and the bullet that went through his leg killed the, the other medic. And this is all in a matter of the time I left to the time I got back. So I never saw those three guys again. 
And that, I was really bothered by that because I thought there might have been something I could have done to help. But if your light was giving out. I mean, yeah. I, I know, mean, but I, that's what you do to yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, and I never saw them again. I never got their real names. <laughs> So did you went you went back to the fire base and they determined you were okay and then sent you back to the field? No, I mean, or did I, you they hear about they actually, Well, I had appeared on the, their radio on the aid station. Oh, okay. They said, that can't oh. be. I just left those guys. And I mean, they stuck pins in my leg. I could, so instead of sending me back to the field, they sent me to... Uh, I can't remember. That's when I went to Kit Carson School. Or when I went to combat leadership, but it, yeah, one of those. No. Um, let's see. When I hit, was wounded after the booby trap. I think that's when they sent me to Kit Carson School. Where is Kit Carson? Well, it's not. They call it Kit Carson that because the, these were. Vietcom that had come over to our side, and you were paired with, you know, a, an American was paired with one of these Vietcom, and they were supposed to be like a scout. You know, knew the area and all this kind of thing, and we learned how to talk Vietnamese and learned to work together and all that. Or some Vietnamese, you know, some Vietnamese could do it better than others. You know, the, the Vietnamese would speak, learn English, and. They work with us out in the field. Did you trust them? Um, not to begin with. After a while, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, his name was Lee Van, no. His name was Lee, Lee Tom. Lee Tom. Lee, Lee Tom, or something. L-E-T-H-A-N-H. -H. But he was from the lowlands, so he was no good in the mountains where we were mostly. Where you were mostly. Yeah, except when we monsoon season we'd be in the lowlands because they could resupply us there <laughs> where everything was flooding and yeah well they sent us oh. there was a break in the weather and they sent us to do something it was going to be like a 24-hour mission in and out well the weather sucked it and we had enough food for what three days just because we always carried it we were there for eight days. Oh. We started getting mortared. We actually had a canine dog with us, a scout dog, that we tied to a tree during the mortar attack so it would be killed so we could eat it. But it didn't, and we couldn't kill it because it was a man like us. Yeah. <laughs> and they tried dropping food to us, and they you know, never got to us. And, you know, it was very pleasant. That was after you, you stepped on the movie no, I think that was, must have been before. Okay. I don't, you know, that, my yeah. See, chronology is not, I'm just kind of rambling. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's all right. But I do remember that. It was wet, freezing, mortars. <laughs> there was another time we were somewhere, we were on a ridge line and had been occupied at one point, there were foxholes. You know, up the through line and around like this. Excuse me. And this other guy and I are a fox all over. You know. And they start lobbing 60 millimeter mortar, mortars, which was, you know, it's bad enough, but they're not anything real big. And they start walking them up the ridge line. And, you know, here's our fox hole. And boom, boom, boom. And I asked the lieutenant, and sir, can we move either up or down just <laughs> we in move case? Now. Nah, I say, yeah, boom, you know, over us. Oh my gosh. But you could, I mean, they were, you could watch them come in, you could see them. That's how slow they were moving. You almost want to run out and catch one just to. That is wrong with that. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Take that. Yeah, well, that I, I carried hand grenades. There's a point, man, I, you know. But I carried many hand grenades. I used to have two canteen pouches that were full of the baseball type hand grenade. Right? So I carried about 10, where most guys would carry two. Okay. Because I just loved them. <laughs> you loved to use them too? I did. Well, I, I got to be very good at them. You know, 
this hill that I told you about that we tried to get in as many times and they finally brought the B-52s in. Yeah. Top of the hill was clear. Big rock. And I remember tossing grenades all the way down that hill because there was nothing to hide behind. Okay. And it was like there was jungle when I'm here. And I still remember one guy saying, Is he, I, I can see him, I see him. And somebody else yelling, we'll shoot them. <laughs> But I mean, when we climbed down that, we got down into the thick of things, you know, found some blood trails, but no evidence, you know, there was nobody there, and then we found the tunnel. And the tunnel went down about you know, eight feet and then veered off into the mountain. And they wouldn't let us go into that either. So they, they, you didn't go down the tunnel? You didn't go down the tunnel. I mean, I wouldn't have gone in any. But we had guys that had volunteered to go into the tunnel. Nope, we're bringing some engineers out here. Out in the middle of nowhere, I don't think so. So, I don't know, I, to this day, I don't know why we didn't do something. But we Could you have thrown a grenade in there? Oh, we did that. Yeah. We threw tear gas and grenades. They were and, probably fine. Oh, yeah, I'm they sure. Yeah, I'm sure they would. Because if they could come out and fire after a B-52 strike that was knocking me off my feet at three kilometers away. Yeah. It was deep enough. Yeah, because we didn't have a lot of contact. And we went a lot of places, and, but, you know, maybe three or four different firefights, that was about it. The guy, other guys, especially guys that had been there before us, were in constant fighting. And then, uh, and I remember we were on a stand then where we would go to the rear and resupply and rest a little bit. The other guy and I was throwing a softball. And I threw the softball, next thing I knew, it's flat on my face. Um, and I went to the aid station, I had two shattered vertebrae. But, well, they told me I had two shattered vertebrae. They gave me a permanent profile, so I couldn't go out of the field anymore. So where did that come from? Like, probably when I hit that log, okay. when I fell out of the helicopter, you know, two months before. Okay. So I went, you know, I'm saying, when I'm sick, call, I figured, you know, a couple days rest, I'd be good as new. They sent me for x-rays, and so I couldn't, you'd have what's called spondyloliasis. And it's either shattered or, you know, or it did not form correctly. Well, I said, if I had a back problem, why am I here? <laughs> so it must have happened here. It must have happened here. And uh, so they put me to work in a stand down area, which means there's a, uh, an area on the base where guys would come in from the field, you know, they rest for a couple, three days. And, you know, they get drunk and they do this and uh, resupply and got clean up. No food. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and they tear the place up and we put it back together. And New Year's Eve, 1970, I was going from the stand down area back to my actual company area. And I was riding on what we call a mule, which is a it's almost like a four-wheeler, okay. but it's got a flatbed used to carry some stuff like the helicopters and that kind of thing. When there's a driver here, I'm here sitting next to him. There's no, no seat, just on the, the only seat is for the driver. Yeah. And there's two guys on the back, and we're driving from you know, point A to point B. On the base. On the base. Okay. And I say it was New Year's Eve. And this thing would only go maybe 20 miles an hour. And we got hit by a three-quarter ton truck doing about 50. The guys were drunk. Well, the guys in the back saw it coming. So they they jumped, but they didn't say anything. You know, they just, and bam. Now, I got thrown about 30 feet. The mule went over me, I mean, past me. And I don't know where the driver went. Did they hit you sideways? No, they hit right from the back. Just launched. 
So I'm in this ditch. And I was talking to a psychologist about this a couple weeks ago. And I said, I do not remember how I got from that ditch to the aid station. But I do remember when I was in the aid station, they wanted to give me stitches. And I said, I've never had stitches before, and I'm not having them now. Well, I went from a, a second lieutenant doctor up to, I think, a lieutenant colonel who said, you gave me a direct order saying, you will have stitches. And I put eight stitches in my head and another six in my leg. And, then, and that was from that accident. That was from that accident. And that's how I spent New Year's Eve, 1970. And I got up, I woke up the next morning and felt like I'd been hit by a truck. Uh -huh. And that was on the base that with on other base. Americans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I did get to a Bob Hope show, which was amazing, only because there were so many people there. Yeah, when was when was that? Christmas time, you know, a little before Christmas, uh, 1970. Okay. I can't remember who was with him. I just remember there was probably 20,000 people there. Wow. No, it couldn't have been that many. But there was a lot. I remember those shots. It was a, there was a lot. What, what base we want to post? Do you remember? Hubei. Hubei? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. They're just, I couldn't believe how many people were there. So were you brought in to those shows if yeah. you were out in the field? Well, or whatever? they did bring in guys from that, those shows. I was out of the field by then, so I just, they sent me because I was there. Okay. <laughs> but they did, they brought in helicopter and they put guys, or they tell guys, you're going to Bob Hope show or whatever. Okay. And they come in on, you know, dirty and nasty. Oh, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. I remember that picture. The guy almost shot me with a forty five, which was clearing it. And the bullet missed my foot by about that far. <laughs> I, wanted to, I, wanted, I wanted to kill him. I, did. I think that was the maddest I ever got. And then, oh, I didn't tell you about Fireman's Gladiator. I don't know if you ever heard of Ripcord, Fireman's Ripcord. Yeah. It was probably one of the last major battles. Yeah for the 101st Air <coughs> The uh, Supreme Commanders at that time thought it would be a good idea to go into the Ashaw Valley, which was a almost like a, a rest and recreation for the NBA and the Viet Cong. That's where they had all their supplies and artillery. Oh, okay. and, and many, 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 many men. So, in their wisdom, they were going to build or rebuild what was called Firebase Ripcord. And they landed all these guys on this hill, and they got fire, they got received fire from the time they landed until the time they left. Because this hill was here, there was a hill. You know, not quite that high, but you know, yeah. and another one over here, and another. So there, it was lower than all the surrounding hills, and they fired directly into it. And we were supposed to go into the Ashaw to, uh, you know, be big battalion strength push to drive, drive them out. And I can remember getting ready for that. Everybody carried two hundred rounds of M60 ammunition. All the ammunition we carry, and the medics were going around giving us our own IV bottles. That's how bad the Eshaw Valley was. And we get into a Chinook helicopter, and we're getting ready to go, and they changed this, and we landed on a hill about probably six kilometers away to build another to build a fire support base for Ripcord. And when I say it was a hill, it was, I mean, it was like a ridge line. It was very narrow and very steep. And in order to dig a fighting position on the side, you had to dig down in feet and shelf it out. And we did that. 
We were there, I think it took us eight days to do that. And you could watch fire uh, ripcord being shot at with 51 caliber machine gun fire. You could see the tracers going in and the explosions and all this. I don't, I don't know how those guys survived. Wow. But we, we built this fire base. And I remember that a helicopter came in and um, we used to burn human waste. Yeah. 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 And this helicopter knocked one of these cans over oh. with burning diesel fuel. And it went down and got a guy's rucksack on fire. And the rucksack contained two hand grenades. And we're all just standing around waiting, you know, see what's going to happen with the rucksack. It's out against the wire. And it blows up. And I remember ducking. And I would, I was standing in front of my company commander. And I ducked and he got hit in the chest with shrapnel. Not serious, but yeah. that's how good my reflexes used to be. <laughs> but that, yeah, we built that and then we went out and uh, tried to, you know, give them some protection out in the jungle, trying to find people. But <coughs> we were fortunate we didn't. We tried. Um, and then I remember, I don't know how long ago, like, well, we set up one night and I dealt the company, one of the other companies, that when you go to sleep, you set up what are called Delta Tangos, which are defensive targets. Okay. You plot them on the map and you give those map coordinates to the artillery guys and then they fire all night around you. Okay. Well, this guy didn't know we were in his defensive target area. And I slept through it. <laughs> oh my God. But <clears throat> I had a, made a, out of a poncho, and a, and a poncho you'd make hoochins sleep under. And I tied one side to a big, I mean, a big massive tree, and then set up the other side. And I woke up in the morning, there's a piece of artillery shell like this embedded in that tree. And I slept right through it. Couldn't Jeez. believe it. That's exhausting for you. And then I know I, I don't know how long it was. I think maybe two weeks. We went back up on the Gladiator, and the, the defensive position that I had dug, or we had dug, wasn't there anymore. We'd been hit by two RPGs. <laughs> so somebody was looking out for me because. Yeah. There was many times that I should not have been here and I still am. And then we got out of that and got notified that we were getting, I, I was getting there early out. I was supposed to be there until the end of February or uh, beginning of March or somewhere. But I left January 23rd, 29th. 29th. So was this after your injury? So yeah, you right. did this? Oh, yeah, yeah, but that, you know, there was a whole bunch of them. They just, they shortened our tour. Okay. They were trying to bring in Vietnamization, you know, letting the Vietnamese do all the fighting. And, you know, that's when they were drawing American troops. Okay. That was cool. And you know, just, it was, time goes by. Yeah. And then we were gone. Back to Fort Lewis, had a steak dinner with french fries, <laughs> shower, new clothes, a new Class A uniform. Actually, I was surprised that you went over with all your stuff with a duffel bag and they put it in storage. And then before you leave, you were supposed to give it back to you and they actually got mine back to me. This is Jeez. amazing. So we turned all that stuff and got new stuff. And I think we got in about you know, somewhere eight in the morning, you know, processed all this, had the food, got the new stuff. I had a flight from Seattle to Hartford the next morning at six o'clock. Got on that plane, and the fog was so thick that we couldn't leave the 12th. Oh. And we sat on that plane for six hours. 
Probably the worst six hours of your. The guys got drunk. <laughs> oh. But I remember left Vietnam was 101 or 102 degrees. And 36 hours later, I was in Hartford for 40, whatever, 48 hours. And it was four below zero. And that hurt. It, yeah, I've been. That hurt. I've been. Big time. And Sharon and my stepbrother picked me up, took me back to the house. My parents had a new house at this point that they had built while I was gone. So I said, I'm going to bed, and Sharon came up to give me a kiss goodnight, and I knocked her out, punched her. Yep. Because she surprised me by. Oh, uh, yeah, you were still up there. Yeah, and then, like five, six days later, a bunch of people took me to the stagecoach. Like a welcome home. Yeah. And I made the mistake of sitting with my back against the open room. And the waitress went to fill my water glass and she ended up on the table. So, I immediately changed spots. Yeah, that's. that's and I'm still, you know, I hear a loud noise now that I don't know what's coming and I'm down and out. That's what our, one of the stories. Do you know Rod, Ronnie Zenobi from? Norfolk, he was in the CBs, and uh, he was the first interview I sat in on with Eileen. She interviewed him. She knew him from growing up. And uh, she asked him if he ever went to the movies about Vietnam. And he said, no. And he said, it's not because of the content, it's because of the noise. He said, you can't stand hearing those sounds again. Actually, the first movie I saw when I got back was Mac. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> but oh, was it? It was that was fun. It was okay. Um, you know, like I say, I was lucky because I could adjust. I adjusted. You know, that's how you handled it. It did. I, you know, we took it day by day, and after that first uh, that episode where I started shaking and crying and turning on, it was just something you did. And you survived, and did. because you had to survive. I did survive. Yeah. Did you stay in touch with your family? Tell me. Yeah, wrote a letter. Just letters? Or? That's the only way we could do it. Mm -hmm. There was no cell phones. So. No. Yeah, Plus, you couldn't take that yeah. out in the field anyway. I mean, that's I'm, when I was, when we were preparing for the veterans um, assembly at school, Mm -hmm. I would say to the kids, you're going to write to the, you're going to write to the veterans and invite them to come because that's the way they always communicated sure when did. they were serving the country. Right. And you know they would say, well, I saw on TV that you know some some guy over in Afghanistan was skyping his wife and baby, and I said they were on post in a secure position. I said when you went out, you didn't hear the rest of that interview because the, the soldier would say, when I went out in the field, I couldn't take any of that with me. Well, because that's how they when find you, it. When you look at this, the, the telegram. Yep. <laughs> I could have sworn that I filled out something that said if I got hurt, not to notify anybody. Oh, okay. Well, evidently I didn't, or they didn't get it, or whatever. That was delivered by a major in full uniform to my house and my mother was not there. My stepsister was there. And she told the guy, you know, that Mrs. Warner's not here at the moment. He said, okay, I'll be back. So, and he didn't come back for like five hours. So when my stepsister tells my mother that there's a guy here with from the uniform. army. Wow. Yeah. I mean if you read this Second page. He received wounds to the face, chest, stomach, and both arms. The attending physician reports there is no eye or brain damage. Is that supposed to make you feel better? Exactly. What's the rest of me look like? <laughs> and especially for, with a mother. Yeah. Since he is not, repeat, not seriously wounded, 
no further reports. And I didn't know that was sent. And uh, <clears throat> so I didn't, I didn't write home about it or anything. Well, Sharon and Suzanne Holden, Suzanne Hutchins, yep. got together and they wrote a letter to a congressman or whatever at that time about me having done all, you know, done this and done that, been hurt and this, that. Well, the congressman started a congressional investigation. So I'm in Vietnam. A company commander calls me and he says, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. Well, I've got this here. And he made me read it. And stand on the desk and read it out loud. And then he said, you will go to, we had Mars stations. That was where you, you call somebody in the States like a shortwave radio or something, and they put a call through to the family. Okay. And, you know, you'd say, hi, how are you doing? Over. And then you'd flip the switch and you could hear the other. So I had to call home and say I was fine. And to back off the... Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. All, yeah. Part of the, all part of what they did. That's it. And I remember the last... Night I was there. We had a red alert on the base camp in Fubai, which means everybody goes to the bunker line. And, you know, and I went to the armory and I grabbed an M16 and I grabbed probably two or three bandoliers and magazines, loading magazines, and two flat jackets. And I sat on the steps of the orderly room. And I say, if they get this far, I'll defend it with all I've got. <laughs> and I'm not going out there. <laughs> yeah, because you feel like it's more of a target. Yeah. Oh. Well, let's, that, uh, what was the food like? Sea rations. Sea rations. Did you learn to love it? No. <laughs> you learned to eat it. Is it. Yeah, you opened it and it was cold. And well, sometimes it was cold. Well, sometimes you were able to eat it. Oh, okay. tabs, or we use C4. Okay. You know, plastic explosives for burn real hot, real fast. And, huh. uh, yeah. and then enough supplies, that was when you would drop in your supplies. Uh, but a couple times, no, it sounded like when you were. No. Yeah. Well, you, you, you trade off, you know, somebody might like ham and lima beans. Ham and, uh, maybe it was lima beans, or. Yeah. <laughs> beef steak or beef something in Greece. Ham steak. Spaghetti and meatballs. Really? Yeah. But we were lucky. We had a guy from New Orleans who was a sous chef. So we had hot sauce and mustard and meat. And, you know, he'd, he'd get rice and he'd mix this stuff all together. Excellent. And we didn't have it all the time. When we knew it, when we might be going to the rear, we got the feast. Okay. But it was good. That, that, the only guy I know is Wayne Gobert. Wayne Gobert. Wayne Gobert. And I remember before I left also, there was something that had to be done at night. They had to try and go from Fubai to Camp Evans or Camp Eagle, which was not that far away, at night. And they asked me to ride shotgun, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't go out at night. This was after I'd been blown up. Yeah. And I just, and I felt bad about it, but I glad I told him I'd be no good to you if something happened. Because I, I couldn't go out. And then I got home, sharing that little poodle, and had outdoor lights, and I couldn't go outside that light for about six months. I did not feel safe at night. So you're going to have to walk me to my truck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> Jeez. No. Was there anything special you did for good luck? Did you carry anything with you no. or anything like that? Hmm. Sounds like you had your guardian. I don't think I did. I know I made a 
the necklace at one point out of hand grenade the pins were pulled from hand grenade. But I don't think I care I don't think I carried anything for good luck. Okay. Um, did people entertain themselves when you were when you made it back to a base? Like would you play cards or Oh yeah. Or anything like that? But, uh, most of the areas had a EM club or Leslie Man's Club. We had one in our company area that, you know, you could get beer, soda, play pool, ping pong, okay. and movies every now and then. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you ever go on leave? Yeah. Uh, I took in my the middle of it all? Huh? In the middle of it all? Yeah. I took my R and R late. I took it in November. The next year in Hawaii. <coughs> Good. Yeah. It went quick. But then again, I was in the International Garden, International Marketplace in Hawaii, which is an open area. You know, you got all these different stores or whatever. And a lot of noise hit, and I was in the vegetation house. And I was lucky because my uncle lived in Hawaii. Okay. So we took care of my hotel bill and the little car. Ah, that's nice. <laughs> that was very nice. Yeah. But it didn't allow me enough money to pay for Sharon's ticket. Yeah, it was fine. And then we got back. And a month and a half before I came home. Okay. I didn't know that at the time, but yeah. Yeah. Do you remember any humorous events? Numerous events. Like pranks or anything? It sounds like you didn't really have time for that. No, I don't remember a lot of that. Okay. What did you think of your fellow officers and servicemen? I was lucky to be in the 101st Airborne. Everybody was pretty sharp, for the most part. Okay. There were guys that, you know, there were slackers on all of it, I'm sure, but. For the most part, everybody carried their weight, except in that first fire fight. Some guy who'd been there a while, he's into a hole that deep, he's firing his, you know, over his head, <laughs> weapon, he goes through about eight magazines and nothing flat, and then he tells me to go, and I'm hiding behind a tree, about that big around, and he tells me, go make me more ammo. Said, no, go get your own ammo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there were a few guys that talked, you know, not just a few that talked to John Wayne stuff and then would be hiding at the drop of a hat. Yeah. And that was. In the reality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you keep a journal? I did not. I wish I had. Yeah, that's what some people I say. wish I had. I do. I wish I didn't like. And about two weeks before I left, somebody stole a lot. Yeah, you said the scrapbooks. The yeah. scrapbooks. How did you? How did you um get the photos developed? Well, when you go back yeah. on the base. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. There's a PX that would do photos for me. Okay. And a lot of them I sent home. they just a film home. They develop them here. Okay. But any pictures that were here put in scrapbooks and in my basement. Basement flooded. Yeah. They were gone. Yep. Usually they have to be the only ones I can save. Tough. Look at that skinny little kid. Yeah, Good that's right. God. <laughs> this is like I say, this is when I first got there. Um okay, your service ended. January 29th. Yep. Okay. And you talked about your homecoming. Did you um, did you work or go back to school afterwards using GI Bill? Um, well, when I got back in January, I was on leave. Yeah. And then I came in went to Fort Benning. Okay. I finished out my time there. Okay. <coughs> so when was your actual... I got out... July 13th, I think, 1971. Okay. And then came home. 
Okay. Well, I remember I got out and flew home because my sister was getting married the next day. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So your homecoming was great because everybody was there? Or mm -hmm. was it well, not so cold? I don't remember it. Okay. Because right after the wedding, I got on a plane with Sharon and flew back to Georgia to pick up my car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Sharon was, was your rock through the whole thing, pretty much. Yeah. She was. Did you, um, did you go back to school? I did. Okay. Northwestern. Good. What did you get? Uh, I got a, I mean, actually, I got on the service to go to school. Right. They didn't know they had the service. To start like summer school, and I went there, and then I was doing pretty well too. Probably the best grade that I ever had in my life. <laughs> and then I got in the parking lot one night, and I looked at all these kids because I was now 20, 22, going on twenty three years old. Right. And with all these seventeen and eighteen year olds that you know were all against the war at that time, I'm, and I could not get out of the car, and I drove. I never went back. Yeah, okay. Yep. Pretty good. Um, did you make close friendships in the service? Did you kept in touch with anyone? No. no. A lot of coming and going. Say again? A lot of coming and going with the platoons. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, once you got, like I say, these were, these were my best friends for five months. Okay. And then they were gone. So, yeah. So, so you didn't make, you, I, you know, I just didn't make them. Okay. You just did your job. You did your job, not yeah. just. You did your job. Um, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Sorry. Wars should be fought to be won. They should not be fought for any other reason than to do your best to win. And we did not do that. We were just at one step above Korea. And we could have. At the one point, there was 450,000 American troops in Vietnam. There were only 50,000 combat troops. You could have put all those people in a line and marched them right up into North Vietnam and annihilated But, no, you, you don't fight a war unless you're going to win it. And that's why I'm so disgusted about how they're doing Afghanistan and Iraq and all that kind of thing. If you want to win, win. Don't talk about it. Don't man be pandy it commit and we didn't commit did you join any veteran organizations here yeah. i am okay good <laughs> are member, you pretty I'm, active no i'm a member of the american legion and the vfw good. I, i've been an american legion member for a long time but i haven't go there i've only been a member here Three, three years, four years. Okay. Did you ever attend any reunions? One. one. Just one. That was the one where you saw, yeah. Yeah. Did you figure out a way to keep in touch with them? Because you said you saw it on oh, yeah. the website I, or I, something. I, I so. called a couple of them. Good. Yeah. Okay. Try to do that. And, you know, it, it was great to see them, but everybody's the same way. But, yeah. You know, you just, you the wrong of your life. Um, how did your service and experience affect your life? Well, I'm pretty screwed up. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> um, I don't know. Got out of the service. Got married. Went to work. Had children. Kept working. Got grandkids. I do now, yes. I do. But that's, you know, it. and only until recently has it really started to affect me a little bit. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's not severe, but PTSD. Yeah. 
some different ailments showing up. Well, I remember um, hearing one of the, um, I think he was a um, Special Medal of Honor winner, Paul Baker, I think his name was at the Vietnam 50th. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that everyone pretty much has some form of PTSD. He said it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. And it's he said it's gone. just. Shell shock. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. But, I mean, I've always, since then, I've always, loud noise is just. I can't get over it. I, I try, I try to ignore it, but my body is conditioned that you hear a loud noise. And I think that's because I got me. Yeah. And I can't fight it. And, you know, as much as I try, it's just there. Well, you've got, you've got strength of family and friends and your wife. Yeah, I'm kind of a loner. Yeah. 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 Well, anything else you'd like to add? I think that's about it. Yeah, I can't. I can't think of anything. Okay. Thanks so much, Don, for letting me interview you. Hey, I can't say it's my pleasure, but I'm happy to do it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I really I do. Just ramble a little bit. That's